all, let's say amen just one more time. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this season. Though you probably were not born on December 25th, Lord God, we don't know when you were born, but Lord, we are celebrating your birth, Lord God. Because just the fact that you were born as a baby, that you took off the robes of divinity and put on the shell of a human, Lord God. Lord, it's very telling and it, and it reminds us that you love us more than anything else in this entire universe. Lord, may we always constantly be reminded of your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Some of you know that though I now live in Maryland, and though I had previously lived in New Jersey for almost eight years, I'm a Philly boy at heart. I love the city of Philadelphia. And if you know me well, you would also know that I relentlessly follow Philadelphia sports teams. Amen. Amen. I got a couple of them. <laughs> Pastor Defoe and his Red Sox and his Celtics, he can keep his Boston teams. Amen. But I, I, I love my Philly sports teams. Now, I don't care that I live in Redskins territory. I'm going to root for and support the reigning NFL champions that beat the Patriots. Amen. My Philadelphia Eagles. I've never been to Nationals Park because my baseball team doesn't play there, but, but I have been to Citizens Bank Park to watch my Phillies play on many occasions. By the way, most black folk aren't too much into hockey, but I, I must admit that, that come playoff time for hockey in, in April, if my Philadelphia Flyers are in the tournament, you better believe I'm sitting right there in front of the television. But my, my absolute favorite Philadelphia team has gotten a lot of publicity over the past several years. Much of the publicity they've been getting hadn't been good publicity. I, I admit that. Usually it's the teams that, that have been winning championships that, that get the lion's share of publicity, and, and rightly so. And so over the, 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 the past several years, two teams that have collectively won the past four NBA championships have been in the spotlight because of how good their teams have been. The Golden State Warriors and the Cleveland Cavaliers have had players like Steph Curry and uh, uh, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green, Kevin Durant, LeBron James, Kevin Love, and Kyrie Irving. But, but a couple of years ago, my Philadelphia 76ers haven't been in the spotlight because of how good the team has been. See, before last season, my, my 76ers hadn't, had, hadn't made the playoffs, nor had we had a winning record in seven long years. In fact, Three seasons ago, the 76ers garnered the worst record ever for an NBA team winning only 10 out of, 88, uh, of, out of 82 games. Uh, uh, but, 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 but more than what seemed like decades of losing seasons, get this, uh, what has really gotten the headlines in the sports world about my team is how this happened. See, the former general manager of the 76ers who handles all of the hiring and firing of the basketball players had been under intense scrutiny because he seemed to purposely dismantle the roster. Before Sam Hinkie became the GM, the team had gotten to the playoffs four out of the six previous years. That's not bad. That, that's pretty good. But, but he somehow felt the need to get rid of some of the better players on the team. Someone may be wondering why he would do that. Conventional wisdom would say that if, if you have some players that are half decent, that you would keep them around so that you could win. But the problem was that the players that the Sixers had on their roster were good enough to sometimes go to the playoffs, but they would never have been good enough to win a championship. The ultimate problem was that they were stuck in an endless round of mediocrity. 
Therefore, the solution was to do something drastic so that the team could have the best chance of not just being a fringe playoff team, but the best chance of actually winning an NBA championship. And I'm sure that you're forming the natural question in your mind, well, if he got rid of the better players on the roster, then how could they ever compete for the NBA championship? You need good players to win, right? Are you with me? And that's absolutely correct. The best players win championships. And so the question then becomes, how do you actually get the best players on your team's roster? And there are two ways you get talent on the team roster. How many ways are there? Two ways. A team can either sign free agents from other teams when their contract is expired, but that route tends to be expensive and risky. The best way to replenish and build a team is through the draft when the best college uh, basketball players are chosen. And so in the, in, in, in the NBA, those with the worst records receive the greater chance of receiving the first pick in the draft the next year. Everybody wants the first pick in the draft. You get to choose whomever you want. If you get the first pick in the draft, the, the greater your team's chance of being a championship team. And so the GM's philosophy was that many times things have to get much worse before they get better. You know it. And I'm here to decree and declare that the 76ers are back and we're here to stay. We're my Philly fans. I, I heard them right over here. Amen. Thank you so much. When all of the doubters were heckling the way he handled the 76ers, the general manager created this mantra for the team to rally around. He said, trust the process. It was understood that the Sixers would not be good for a few years, but you had to trust the process. In order for the best future result to come about for the team, you had to trust the process. You couldn't be half in, half out on the plan. You had to see the plan come to fruition until the very end. And this wasn't an instantaneous plan that would, that would see immediate results. The team didn't get into their losing predicament overnight, and they sure didn't get out of it overnight. And when the team selected injured players in a draft that couldn't play right away, but those injured players had a higher potential of anyone that was healthy, you had to trust the process. When they still lost, even after good rookies were selected for the team, you had to trust the process. When the future look, looks bleak, you have to trust the process because the process is what will catapult you towards greatness. Our scripture this afternoon might seem like a strange kind of scripture. It's not directly about Christmas, but I, I'll connect the dots in just a bit. If you just look up here on the screen, uh, it, it, it's coming from Matthew chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Uh, and if you open the, the word or look on the screen, uh, uh, this is uh, a, a genealogy of Jesus. And it, it's pretty lengthy. It's, it's repetitive. Uh, uh, this person begat that person and begat then that person was the father of this person. So we're not going to take the time to actually read the entire thing. But there are specific things about the genealogy of Jesus that I need us to understand during this Christmas season. So here we are in verse 1, and then we're going to skip uh, some of these verses up until verse 17. Here's what the Bible says. This is the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Judah, this is verse 3, the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Verse 5, Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Uh, verse 6, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. And I'm skipping all the way down to 16 and 17. Here's what the Bible says. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the mother of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who was called the Messiah. Thus, there were 14 generations in all, from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile of Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. You may be wondering what all this talk about trusting the process and the genealogy of Jesus have to do with the Christmas story. 
The Gospel of Matthew begins its rendition of the birth of Jesus, not in a normal way, but it begins it after it lists the genealogy of Jesus. Are you, th are you there with me? I said, are you there with me? It lists the rendition of the birth of Jesus after it says the genealogy. And so Matthew doesn't start with the well-known event of the nativity itself. That's not where he starts the story. See, we want to know about the star that the wise men followed from the east. That, that, that's, a, that's an enjoyable part of the story. We, we want to skip over to the part about the angels singing praises to God in the middle of the night as shepherds watch their sheep. We like to hear about the manger that held the newborn baby Jesus. But instead of Matthew immediately going to those important details in the Christmas story, he lists a tedious genealogy of Jesus. And I must admit that even for me, it's easy to lose patience with these verses and let my eyes skim down the page to find the real action of Christmas. However, Christmas isn't just the story about a birth. That's not the full story. Christmas is also about the story of a coming. This isn't just the story of an event, but it's the story of a process. There was a process involved in this Christmas story. It wasn't just a static, isolated event in history. This was a dynamic, unfolding of the first coming of our Messiah over the course of thousands of years. God had planned for the arrival of his son before he even created the earth. Don't believe me? Here's what the Bible says, Revelation 13 and verse 8. It calls Jesus the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. Meaning before the earth was even created, before we were even a thought, before we even sinned, Jesus was the lamb slain. God had a plan worked into history, and he is not a procrastinator. This wasn't a last minute plan. He did it way before things even came into fruition. We learned last week that this world is a very dark place. And so in his foreknowledge and omniscience, his all-knowing, God knew that this world would have some issues. And Jesus himself made a decision before creation not just to live and die, but also to be born just for us. Because God planned for Jesus' arrival on earth, he foreshadowed the great person that Jesus would be throughout salvation's history. This is why Matthew started his gospel not with the birth of Jesus, not with just the event, but he starts his gospel with a genealogy, a family tree of Jesus. And the genealogy gives us much more about the meaning of Christmas than first meets the eye. Are you ready to discover this today? Here it is. Firstly, firstly. We notice how long it took for the process to come to fruition. How long? The promise of the Messiah took generations to be fulfilled. There were, as we read in the scripture reading in verse, uh, verse 17 of, of Matthew chapter 1, it says, there were 14 generations between Abraham and David, 14 generations between David and the exile, and 14 generations between the exile of, of Israel and the Messiah being, being born. 42 generations in all. God had made a promise to Abraham that all the people of the earth would be blessed through his descendants. That was the promise that God gave him. But it was actually centuries before that promise, before that event, that God himself prophesied to Adam and Eve that had just sinned and ate of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil about the coming of Jesus to crush the head of Satan. God had always been promising this event. And when the angel came to Mary and told her about the child she would bear, 
She broke out in praise and said this. Luke chapter 1, verse 54 and 55 is up here on the screen. Here's what it says. Uh, he has, is what Mary said. He, talking about God, has remembered to be merciful to Abraham. That's an echo of the promise that God gave to him. Just as he promised our ancestors. Mary understood that God had been promising the birth of the Messiah to Abraham. And even before Abraham, to everybody that had preached about it before then. That promise was a long time coming. As a matter of fact, in the 400 years before Jesus was born, there were no prophets that ministered to Israel. Not one. It seemed as if God had forgotten his people. It didn't seem like anybody was going to come, let alone God himself. No prophets had ministered. The folk were legalistic. Things were going awry in Israel. It didn't seem like anybody was going to come. But then Jesus was born. You know, that, that's why I, I, I can't judge God by my calendar. Man, you know, there, there's so many times, you know, I'm, I'm going through something right, right now where I, I'm feeling like God is just too late. Like, you know, where, where, where are you? Where, where, what's going on? I, 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 I tend to judge God by my own calendar, and, and God may seem to be slow or seem like he's forgotten you. But in the end, we'll find that he's been working on fulfilling his promises to us the whole time when it seemed like he was absent. It reminds me of the story of Joseph in the book of Genesis. For years, it seemed like God had forgotten about Joseph as he was in and out of prison, working for Potiphar, people forgetting his dreams, and it allowed him to experience setback after setback. But in the end of the story, it became clear that every one of those things that happened in Joseph's life had to happen in order for everybody in the story to be saved. And God may seem like his process in your life is taking forever, but I'm here to challenge you this afternoon to trust the process. Don't jump ship out of this church. Don't jump ship out of a relationship with Jesus. And God will make all things well. That's the first thing, how long it took for the promise to be fulfilled. But, but the second thing, the second thing, we have to remember that Matthew is living and writing in a very particular culture. He's not writing in 2018 right here in Maryland. That's not how we understand, understand the story. And so, so in today's culture, uh, in, in America, genealogies and, and, and family trees don't matter as much nor do they hold much weight in our society. You know, it's nice to look it up, nice to see where we come from originally and all that kind of stuff, but it doesn't really hold much weight in terms of like personally uh, what you accomplish in life for the, for the most part. But, 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 but that wasn't the case in the ancient Near East in, first cent in the first century AD. See, at, at, at that time, genealogies were about much more than who was and who wasn't in your family. It was more than that. See, we, we, we currently live in an individualistic so, uh, society, uh, in, in our culture, where I recommend myself to others with a list of my degrees, a list of my work experience, and a list of my accomplishments. I don't put the accomplishments of my parents on my resume, amen? My employer will look at me like I'm stone crazy. We, we, we just don't do that in our society. And so uh, uh, what, what, what other people in my family have done doesn't hold much weight uh, uh, because we are individualistic. However, that's not how it was done in a more community-driven, family-oriented society that Jesus lived in. In those times, it wasn't just your personal accomplishments that people cared about. People's family and their community, the people you were connected to, played a big role into who they are. So Matthew chapter 1 to us might look like a genealogy, but it's more like a resume for Jesus. Are, are we clear on that so far? Are, are you all right? 
Okay, here it is. A genealogy was a way of saying to the world, this is who I am. You know, a couple of years ago, my, my, my wife and I, we were sitting down, we had connected with some college friends, and we were uh, sitting down talking, and, and uh, one, of my, one of our friends was um, kind of lamenting the fact that, that he was looking for a new job, and so as we probed and as we asked questions, uh, it, it was evident that he had, you know, um, uh, done his resume, submitted it, so on and so forth. He had the qualifications, had the experience. I think he had a master's uh, degree or something like that. Uh, had the experience, had been working in his field uh, for several years, and he just couldn't understand, you know, what, what was going on, why he couldn't get another job in his field. And so uh, another friend of ours was, was uh, just probed even further, and, and she was asking uh, how he had specifically framed uh, his, his, his experience and his education, and she was teaching him to uh, frame the experience just right so that uh, even his experience that he had in church, even though it wasn't part of his professional experience, that he could still list on there that he had volunteered uh, in the IT department at church on those kinds of things. And so she was teaching him to frame his resume just right so that he can land a better job. And it wasn't about telling a lie. This was about telling the truth, but just framing it, framing the truth in just the right light. Uh, but, 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 but here's the thing. Uh, many people aren't as honest with their resumes as others. Uh, you know, some people do a lot more than framing it just right. There are many who flat out lie in order to get a good job. So here's what happens. We're, we're, we're connecting it. See, in the days of Jesus, people also tinkered with their resumes. It's only human nature to leave out the parts of our track record that might not make us look good. And, and people did it then like they do it now. They tinkered with their genealogy, tinkered with their resume. And famous people of that day, such as Herod the Great, he was a king. He, erat he literally did this. He eradicated names from his public genealogy because he didn't want anyone to know that these folk were connected to him. He's like, all right, all right uh, Junebug, uh-uh, let, let, let's get Junebug out of, out of that resume. Pookie, nah, we, we, nah, pookie, nah. Mm, we don't want, we don't want, we don't want Pookie up in this resume. Pookie, you know. He literally did that. And the purpose of a geneal genealogical resume was to impress people with the high quality and respectability of your predecessors. But Matthew does the exact opposite with Jesus. See, this genealogy is unlike any other ancient genealogy. First and foremost, there are five women listed in Jesus' genealogy. How many women? See, in 2018, this isn't unusual, but in an ancient patriarchal society, a woman was never named in a genealogy, let alone five of them. To add insult to injury, most of the women in Jesus' genealogy weren't even Jewish women. They're not even a part of the children of God, of the people of God. These were Gentile women. Tamar, Rahab, Ruth. Tamar was a Canaanite. Ruth was a Moabitess. They were considered unclean. If they went into the temple to worship in Jerusalem, they wouldn't even allow them in a sanctuary to worship God. We could call them gender outsiders or, or racial outsiders in today's terms. But yet, they're still in the genealogy of Jesus. But there's another aspect to, to, to who Matthew names in Jesus' genealogy. It's not just that, that, that they were women or part of another race. See, Matthew is deliberately recalling some of the most dishonorable and immoral incidents in the entire Bible. For example, he says in verse 3, we had already read it, 
uh, uh, in verse 3 of, of Matthew chapter 1, that Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. See, we, we have to remember that what, 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 what happened here. Uh, this story uh, is about Tamar, uh, who deceived her father-in-law, Judah, who was one of the 12 tribes, one of Jacob's sons, deceived her father-in-law into sleeping with her. They had committed the sin of incest, among other sins, and Matthew didn't have to include Tamar's name in Jesus' genealogy. He could have just said, yeah, uh, uh, Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, and just kept moving on. But Matthew Listed. He said, and their mother was Tamar. He lists her name on purpose so that the story of so-called illegitimate children of incest will come to our minds as we read the genealogy of Jesus. It also talks about Rahab. We remember the triumph of Rahab. She helped to save the spies and as, 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 as they spied out Jericho and uh, the walls came tumbling down and Rahab and her family were saved. But, 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 but she wasn't just a Canaanite, but remember from the story of Rahab that she was a prostitute who the Bible, get this, describes, this is in her story, the Bible describes her as waiting just inside the gates of the city so that as soon as men came into the city of Jericho, they wouldn't have to search very far in order to find somebody to sleep with. And they came in and went out easily and quickly without being seen and embarrassed. That's who Rahab was. But possibly the most interesting character of Jesus' genealogy is found in verse 6. It says... And Jesse, the father of King David. Now, finally, this is somebody that we would all want in our family heritage. King David. The greatest king that Israel had ever seen. King David is royalty. The greatest king that the Israelites had ever seen. He was the one that killed Goliath and killed tens of thousands of Philistines. We know the story of uh, the women seeing Saul has killed his thousands and David killed his ten thousands. He's done the work that God required him to do. But after Matthew says Jesse, the father of King David, we ought not celebrate too quickly because Matthew quickly adds one of the greatest ironic statements in the whole Bible. He says, David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. All right, y'all don't want to talk back to me today. Matthew doesn't even list Bathsheba's name because he conjures up a tragic chapter in King David's life. David had been on the run from King Saul as a fugitive, and a group of men went with him out into the wilderness and put their lives on the line to protect King David. They were called his mighty men. These were the men that risked everything for David, and Uriah was one of the mighty men. Uriah was David's friend that he owed his very life to. Uriah protected him as a bodyguard. Yet, years later, after David became king, he slept with his boy's wife. Then to add insult to injury, after David impregnated Uriah's wife Bathsheba, he arranged to have Uriah killed so that he could marry her. You know, all this reality TV we've been watching, all you, you, you don't have to watch a reality show to have some ratchet entertainment. All you got to do, come on somebody, is open up the word of God. There's enough ratchet stuff in the Bible to satisfy any heart. All these reality shows, open up God's word. Adulterers, adulteresses, illegitimate children, prostitutes, liars, murderers, and you thought your family was dysfunctional.
But it was out of that dysfunctional family, get this, that the Messiah came to this earth and was born. It goes to show that even people that are excluded by culture, excluded by respectability, excluded even by the law of God. These were folk that broke the law over and over and over again, disrespected God. Even those kinds of folk can be included in the family of Jesus. So I'm here to tell us this afternoon that it doesn't matter what your pedigree is. It doesn't matter what you have done. It doesn't matter if you've done prison time. It doesn't matter what crime you, co you committed. It doesn't matter how low you have been. You just have to trust the process in your life. Who would have imagined that Jesus, who had such a dysfunctional family, could have had such a beautiful birth in this world? And it tells us that even though you may also have a dysfunctional past, that God can still birth something beautiful in your life. I wish somebody would say amen in this place. Yes, you may have gone through a divorce. That's in the past. But God is trying to use that divorce to birth into you a beautiful future. Yes, you may have done some time in prison. That's in the past. But God is trying to use that jail time to birth into you a beautiful future. Yes, you come from a family full of quitters. Yes, you come from a family full of liars. Yes, you come from a household of drug abuse. Yes, you come from an environment of sexual abuse. But trust the process. It doesn't matter what your past looks like. Doesn't matter what your resume looks like. Doesn't matter what your genealogy looks like. Jesus can birth a beautiful future into you. So I close, baby. You come from a family that has nothing going for themselves. That's in your past. God is trying to get you past your past and birth you into the promise of salvation for your life. People of God, people of God, God is trying to work something out in your life. I don't know what it is. I don't know what the issues might be. I don't know what your past might look like. But I do know that God is trying to do something within you. And since many times, for many of us, we've been stuck in the present, stuck in the past, refusing to move forward because we believe that those things, those kinds of things should hold us back from what God has planned for us. But I'm here to tell us today that it doesn't matter what your past looks like. It doesn't matter what your family history is. Just trust the process that God is working within you. If you jump ship, if you give up, it will never come to fruition. But trust what God has been doing within you. And what he's trying to birth in you, your future will surely come to pass. For many of us, we've been held back by the things that we've done. Held back by a dysfunctional family, held back by things that have been done to us. But I'm here to invite us today to respond in the affirmative and say, yes, Lord, I, I, I know that you've been trying to work things out in my life. Many times, Lord God, I, I, it, it seems like you're working it out way too slowly. I don't know what's going on, Lord God. I, I, I feel like you're, you're not there sometimes, Lord. But today, I, I'm willing to just trust the process. I know it seems like I'm losing right now, but I do know today that I will win in the future. I know it seems like things are low right now, but I know that you will bring me to a super high that will surpass any other high in this world. And I'm asking for us to just say yes to trusting the process of Jesus Christ. If you're willing to say yes to him, would you just stand to your feet right now, wherever you are, you're standing. You're saying, yes, Lord, I accept your process. I know it looks dark. I know it looks grim. I know it looks like we're losing right now. I know that it just doesn't seem possible, but I will win because of what Jesus has done for us today. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. Heavenly Father, Lord God, Many times I admit I don't understand some of the adversity and the negative things that happen in my own life, Lord God. I, I'm struggling with understanding why you do certain things. Why did you allow my family to experience that? 
Why, why, why do I have such a, 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 a dark and grim family history, Lord God? Why does my household have to be so dysfunctional? These are questions that we're all asking, Lord God. But Lord, even Jesus, your son, had a dysfunctional and dark family history. And if Jesus can have that, and you did something great and wonderful with him and through him, Lord, we know that our future can be, can be bright also. So, Lord, we accept the process that you have been working in and through us, Lord God. And even when we're tempted to give up, to not continue, Lord God, we're standing committing ourselves to trusting the process of your salvation in our life. Because you've promised to never leave us nor forsake us until your work is done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Yeah. 